morning, church. How are we? Very good. Thank you, Tim. Well, it's good to see you all. It's good to see you all. Some of the team and the leaders already of this church have already flown um, off to the Gold Coast. We have our national conference as a church movement uh, that we are gathering from around Australia. journey of building an investment into their own lives of how to manage finances in a godly way. And that was just so good, something that's been on my heart to do for a long time now. You know, in Hebrews 11, the Bible gives us a definition of what faith is. Now, it's pretty rare for the Bible to give a direct definition about a particular word or a particular subject. Um, it's more done in an indirect way, but here in Hebrews 11, verses 1, we read in the New King James Version, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's amazing that faith is a substance. Everyone say substance. Substance, substance is something if you touch the chair next to you or the person next to you, that's a substance. It's a thing, right? It's a thing. Faith is a thing. It's not this just an airy-fairy idea. It's an actual thing. I mean, let, let me put it this way. Some of us, if you've been around church for a long time, you've been into prayer meetings before. I've run prayer meetings like this before. And you go in and you spend some time in there and it's like, you're almost dead. One person alive. One person alive. But you walk in, right? And it's like, no one wants to be there. There is no faith in the room. But I've been in environments, even sometimes over coffee, I've been talking to someone, and the faith that's just poured out there now, it's something that just grabs hold of me, and suddenly in that moment, I feel like I can believe for great things as well. Because faith is not just this idea. Faith is a substance. It's a thing that we... That, that, that God has, has given us things to hope for, the evidence of things not yet seen. Faith is something that we all carry. We know in Romans 12 that we have all been given a measure of faith. We've all been given a measure of faith. You know what? This week, I know that, that those who are going from Bunbury to the conference, I know that their faith is going to come back soon. I know that their faith is going to come back expanded as they encounter God in a fresh and new way. You know what, one of the reasons, and Beck, thank you so much for that personal story, encouraging us in the conference, and I want to add my encouragement to you, let's mark that weekend as a weekend where we encounter God together. Amen? That we all together draw closer to Jesus. Because that weekend is, we, we put that aside 
to build faith. Because something happens when a group of people gather together. That we, something within us, we touch the substance of faith and it expands us. It causes us and moves us from this place where we're living into a greater reality as we begin to believe for the things that God wants us to hope for and believe for. Amen? You know, often Paul writes in his Pauline epistles, we read in the letters he penned uh, how he had seen faith, heard faith, and how faith was communicated. And if we just throw this up, these three scriptures, the first one in Romans, your faith has been reported over the world. Wow, Ephesians 1.15, ever since I first heard, everyone say heard, yeah. heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and your love of God, people everywhere. Colossians 1.4, these are different churches, different groups of people. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all of God's people. Paul had heard about people's faith. Faith is not just this idea, it's something that is all within us. It's a substance. It's something that is going on. I wonder what Paul would say about this church. <laughs> I wonder, would he say, I see your faith. I've heard about your great faith. I heard how your faith has turned to love for your community. What would Paul say about this church? Because I believe God is calling Greenville and Bunbury to be a church of great faith. I believe he's calling us to be a church that has a faith that's seen, a faith that is heard, a faith that can be felt. Amen? Come on, does anyone want to see that kind of faith? Because I believe that when we have a church like that, you can walk in and you can be in your lowest moment, but just because of the faith of someone else, you yourself can be lifted, amen? You yourself can go and move from hopelessness into hope-filledness. That is the power of an environment of faith, that you can come in sick and you can leave healed because someone chose to believe that Jesus changed his lives, amen? But see, we don't preach a dead gospel. We preach a gospel that is full of faith, full of confidence in the hope that Jesus lives, that Jesus saves, that Jesus heals, and he delivers the oppressed. He did it yesterday, and he will do it today, and he will do it tomorrow as well. Come on, let's give Jesus a praise this morning. He's calling us to be a people of great faith. You know, I'm so excited that as a church we are moving into uncharted territories that we haven't been in for a while as a church. You know, we, 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 we worship today in an auditorium that was sewn into and sacrificed by a generation that has gone before us. That we get to enjoy worship in the chairs and the sound system because a generation ago they said, you know what, we want to sew into seeing a church on this side. Amen. We get to enjoy it, and we're so thankful for it. But we're now moving into a new time, into a new season, where I believe collectively we need to have faith for the new thing that God is wanting to do in this church. That many would know that we are working towards a site handover in the middle of June, that we're going to be building an extension on the, the back of this auditorium of, of kids and youth facilities. It's going to have four multi-purpose rooms, it's going to have a new office for the staff, moving them from the edge of site and moving our staff uh, and an office into the center of the school site. It's, a, it's, a, it's an around a three million dollar project that we are embarking on together. And I say together, because this is not just something that Shinto and I have dreamed up, but this is something that needs to happen. Because God has anointed this house to reach children and to reach youth in this city for Jesus. It's an anointing on this side. I mean, back in 1988, when the church was still meeting in Goldsmith Street, they started a school and they had a vision for a school. But it soon outgrew the church that they were in. And they said, we need a bigger place. And then someone said, well, have we looked at the Mayfield site cinema, drive-in cinema, this site? Have we looked at it? Could we afford it? And a group of people in faith decided, let's build a school in the church on this side. Isn't that amazing? And because of the vision and the faith of the past generations as, and leaders, we get to enjoy what we're living in. But, to, but 
right now we're in a season where we come together in faith. And we're going to embark upon a new season altogether. You might go, well, Mark, why do we need that? Well, why, why do we need that? Well, let me tell you, last Friday night, we had over 100 young people come along to our Hine program, filling the space. In another part, in a small classroom, we had 60 pre-teenagers in another youth program. And they were busting out. They couldn't fit in the classroom. On the same weekend, that Sunday, we had 70 kids come to our DBK kids program. And they couldn't fit in the classroom. Therefore, there's never been a better time to begin this build. And it needs us to rise up in faith. I love what it says in Nehemiah. Let us rise up. It's not, oh, let the leaders rise up. No, let us rise up into the things of God together. Come on, who's going to who's ready to rise up together, amen? Who's ready to rise up together? The title of my message today is, Where is Your Faith? Turn to your neighbor and say, where is your faith? Where is your faith? You know, in Luke 8, I've been reading through the Bible in a year, and I got to Luke 8, the fascinating story of Jesus doing many miracles, doing some great preaching. And then he says to his disciples, hey, we're going to go over to the other side of the lake. And so they jumped in the boat and they started to, set, uh, to sail towards the other side of the lake. Jesus falls asleep. And in that moment, the rain comes down, the waves rise and the wind rise. And the disciples start to fret for their lives. They wake Jesus up and says, Jesus, we're going to die. Come do something about it. And in that moment, we don't just see the Jesus that is a great teacher. We don't just see the Jesus who's a great healer or Jesus the deliverer of the oppressed. We see Jesus who is also Lord over the things of nature as well. There's nothing that he cannot do, can I remind someone today. There is a situation that you are in that Jesus cannot help you out of, amen? And he calms the wind, he calms the storm, he calms the rain. And in that moment, he turns says, where is your faith? Everyone say, where is your faith? So this week and next, I want to talk about faith. I want to talk about this subject and this substance that if we carry within us, this substance that if we do not feed it, we can starve it. If we don't use it, we can lose it. But God wants our faith to be stirred as Christians because he wants our faith to be people and in Bunbury to believe for great things to happen in our lives, in our family lives, in this community, our city, and this church. But it takes a people to rise up in faith. He's given us faith, the substance, to believe for what he wants to do. And so I want to dip into the life of Abraham today. I'm going to read a portion of scripture from Genesis 22. Many of you would know Abraham. If you don't, Abraham is, we, we, we call him the father of faith. He's the father of faith. He, he was called by God to start and be the first generation of this new way of living, this new believer in God. He's just chosen to be the father of a new spiritual race. And in Genesis 22, it's an unusual story if we simply look at it with the lens of our current cultural standard. Because in it, God is asking Abraham to sacrifice his son. Now, if we look at it with our eyes of today, that is a crazy thing to ask. It's like, Abraham, run! This God is crazy. But stay with me. If you've got questions like that, I'm going to answer them through the sermon. Let's go. Genesis 22, verse 1. You can follow along behind me. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering as one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took, his, took two of the young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood and the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and, his, and the knife. So 
So they went both of them together, and Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Good question. Abraham said, God will provide. Everyone say, God will provide. For himself, the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went both of them together. Verse 9. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar, on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. Then the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy and do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by the horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of this place that the Lord will provide, as it said to this day, on the mount of the Lord shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, you only your only son, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, and as the sand that is on the seashore, and your offspring shall possess the gate of the enemy, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. Amen. I want to give you some lessons about Abraham's life today. Some faith lessons that we can discover from a man of great faith. And the key thing that we have to remember about this story, the Genesis 22, is that the end of a great journey that Abraham has been on with God, of learning to trust that God is for him, learning the, how God works. And the first lesson I want to point to, we discover it in verse 1, is this, faith listens. Number one, faith listens. God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Everyone say, here I am. He immediately responded. When Abraham was called by God, he responded. Faith is a trust. Faith is confidence. Faith is a reliance. Faith is a, a, is a confidence in God that what he says he will do, he will do. Do we have that kind of faith, Greenwood? That kind of faith that when God speaks to us, that we will respond. Because when Abraham was called, he responded. Abraham's quick answer to the call was a wonderful example of how to live as a person of faith. And if we are to be a people of faith, we need to be quick to listen. Everyone say quick to listen. We need to be quick to listen. Do we respond to God with such a swift listening ear? Are we ready to hear when God is speaking to us? You know, those of us in here that have kids or have had kids and then now growing up, you know, we have that job of trying to get our kids to listen. We use all kinds of techniques to get them to listen. It always starts off in this good, measured way. We say, hey kids, come over here. Kids, do this. Kids, I need you to do this. Or, 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 and we use techniques like the one, two, three. And so often it's four, five, six. <laughs> and so often we start off soft and sometimes we end up in a sort of a tone and a and a volume we don't wish to always use. One week, a couple of weeks ago, I, we, were, we were debriefing as a staff team on a Tuesday, and we were talking about all the activities and the ministry activities that happened during, during the week. We always share testimonies. We talk about the people that we met on the weekends. And, and the kids' leaders quickly packed up, and they quickly told us a story that on Sunday after church, during the checkout lines, when people were collecting their kids, this one mum came to the front of the line and she simply said one word. And all these kids came from different parts of the room and immediately obeyed. And the kids' leaders, as they heard this, they were like, they were amazed. It's like, what is it with this woman? What is this word? What is the secret? Do you know what? Abraham, he listened. And faithful people, they listened. They listened. 
And we are to be a people that listen when God speaks. One of those practices that I put in to my time I spend with God in the morning is actually to take a moment to actually stop, don't say anything, and listen. I imagine myself sitting with Jesus in that moment, however you want to imagine him to look. And I imagine him to sit with him, and I wonder and ask myself, what do you want to say to me? Because I want to listen. I want to know what Jesus has to say to me. And often I write in my journal these words that I that I just feel on my heart to write. And as I read them back, I look at them and go, I wouldn't say that myself. And that's actually how I learn to hear the voice of God. Someone encouraged me, hey Mark, just sit and listen and just write in your journal. And then over time, read it back and you'll discover those are not your words that you would think about yourself or things that you would think about. And so can I encourage you, how do I listen? Well, let's just be people that stop because he wants to talk to us. He wants to talk to us. If we're going to be a faithful people, the number two is this, faith prepared. Faith prepared. We read in this scripture in verse 3, so Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac, and he cut the wood for the burnt offering. He prepared based on what God had asked him to do. He prepared. Do you know what? I was having a conversation recently and someone was saying, hey Mark, I really believe in my heart that God's, God's got this in my future for me. And I just encouraged him and said, you're doing great preparation for this. He's someone that's in our leadership college. He's positioned himself for what he's sensing of a leadership call on his life. What's he doing? He's preparing himself for where he feels God is directing him. At the age of 20, when I was in full-time work back in London, I felt God say to me, it's time, I want you to go to college. I want you to go to Bible college. And I began to make those preparations. I began to look at different colleges. I had this leadership call in my heart. I didn't know quite how it would look. And I just began to make the necessary preparations in order to step in. If God has spoken to you, can I encourage you, perhaps take the necessary preparations to begin to move in that direction. You might not be ready to, 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 to completely fulfill what God is calling you to do, but you can make preparations. You can make preparations. Maybe he's calling you into something. Well, maybe your first preparation is just to begin to have a devotional life with God. Because he wants, if he's calling you into something, well, you better have a relationship with him. Maybe he's calling you into ministry. And there's a call of God on your life. Make preparations. Don't just sit back and think it's just going to happen. Make the necessary preparations. Abraham, he cut the wood. He saddled the donkey. He prepared his men. He got. He knew where he was going to go. He made the preparations. People of faith, prepare. Number two, number three, sorry, is faith, obey. Again, the same scripture, and they went. They went. They began to move in the direction. He was obedient. Upon hearing this crazy demand, Abraham prepared his things to do what God has asked him to do. And what we discover through the life of Abraham, something that is a common element right from the beginning when God first spoke to him, is that Abraham always obeyed. Even when it didn't make sense. Everyone say, it doesn't make sense. Do you know when God calls, it doesn't always make sense. When God, when I felt God say, give up your job, I had a boss that had a great five-year plan for me. I had a great pay package. I had great colleagues around me. I could see my career path. It did not make sense to go to no money on the other side of the world in, Australia, in New Zealand. It did not make sense to be obedient to God's word. But God wants us to be obedient when he speaks. When he speaks, let's be people of obedience. You know, Abraham's life is punctuated with times when he was obedient to God. Do you know when God first called him, he said, Abraham, I want you to leave the land of your fathers, and I want you to walk in the direction, and I'm going to show you how. He didn't even have certainty, yet he obeyed. He was obedient to the call of even to believe for a, a son, to have an inheritance one day. He believed.
believed God and waited for the Messiah. And once again in Genesis 22, we see again he walked out in faith with his son, Isaac. You know, we are called to be a people of faith. We're called to be a people who don't just hear the word, but we do the word. See, we don't want a church here that's tickled in our ears on a Sunday morning and we go and live a completely contrary life to what the word of God is saying. No, we're called to live way God has asked us to live. You know, people of faith, we don't just, just sit here, and, but we, we are to be people that are to be obedient to his word. You know, let's just take a moment just to understand this story for just a second. I mean, what God has asked Abraham to do is huge. Like, sacrifice his son. This is absolutely huge. And if you've grown up in a church context, this story has been normalized, hasn't it? It's like, oh yeah, child sacrifice, all good. <laughs> but this story is anything but that. It's, a, it's enough story. It's like, what is going on? Why is God asking this? You know, the ancient cultural context that, that God is speaking to, that Abraham is living in, the context Abraham was one. He, they would worship many gods. It was called a polytheistic society. They would worship many gods. And they had no idea how to please the gods. So the priests would make different ways up of how to please all these different gods. They would have a god of the rain, they'd have a god of the fertility, god of the harvest, how to have a great harvest. And if you need a great harvest, you need rain. So, and you would do different things, different rituals, different sacrifices in order to have different outcomes. They made it up as they were going along. And so they thought, you know, a child sacrifice. And then someone one time did a child sacrifice, and the next day it rained. And so all of a sudden they put this connection together. Well, if I do a sacrifice of a child, it's going to rain. That's how these crazy religions came about. And so God is Jehovah, Yahweh is speaking into this time of this people that are just guessing what God would God in his kindness begins to show us what he wants. God wants our hearts. He wants connection. But Abraham, he's like, oh God, I thought you were different, but I'm guessing I'm just doing what all my friends did with their first guess. So he goes along with it. And in the moment when he's got his knife in his hand, God speaks out and says, stop. He's essentially saying, I'm not like the other gods. I'm the God of life. The God who sustains life. I'm the one who creates life. Not the one who asks you to take it away. I'm not the God who you have to guess anymore. I've made myself known to you. That is the God that we discover in Genesis 22. And so suddenly we see a God who's asked a child sacrifice. He's actually saying, you don't do that anymore. I'm not that kind of God. I'm kinder and I'm nicer than you ever thought I could be. That is the God we worship. He's simply looking for our heart. He's looking for connection. And he's looking for obedience to his question. So Abraham in that moment, knife in his hand, he has a revelation moment that this God is different to all the other made up gods that the priests had been talking about. And yet Abraham obeyed him and trusted him at every single moment. Amen? And what do we see as the result of Stick verse 17 up. Next slide. And I will surely bless you. Everyone say bless you. And I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Everyone say with, say with me, because you have obeyed my voice. Everyone say it with me, because you have obeyed my voice. Isn't that amazing? All that blessing, all that blessing shall be multiplied to them, their children, the nation, because Abraham was obedient. When we are obedient, do you know what? Your children, they're blessed. They're blessed. When we are obedient to forgive and we don't hold offense against people, our children are blessed. It, 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 when we are obedient to follow God's word, we're blessed. Yeah. Sometimes we think, 
finances left us. Well, it is that, but it's also so many other things as well. God's blessing is this holistic life blessing. Every part of you, your relationships, your businesses, your work, your family, your marriage, your life, your social life, every part of you will be blessed when we choose to listen, prepare, and obey. And that is what it calls to be a people of faith. Amen? Amen. Come on, can we give Jesus a clap of praise? He's made himself known. Look towards the heavens and the number of stars. If you're able to number them, then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. There's this beautiful thing we've got to learn, church, of how to look up. How to look to Jesus, even in our times of disappointment, even in times where we're still waiting for God to come through, even when things don't seem to be going our way and everything seems to be against us. We need to know how to look up. I love this encouragement in the Psalms. We see in Psalm 121 verse 8, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come from? Psalm 123 verse 1, I lift up my eyes to you, the one enthroned in heaven. Even Isaiah picks up on this idea. Lift up your eyes on high who created all things. We're getting the picture here. Hebrews chapter 1 and, uh, sorry, chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips, trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this. How do we do all that? We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. We lift up our eyes on Jesus. Amen? How is our faith perfected? How? Are we setting our sights on Jesus? That is the answer. Too often, our sights get stuck. Too often, our sights are getting stuck on the things of the world. We're distracted by the things and the temptations of this world, and our sights fall from the things and the passions that we used to have as a young Christian, and suddenly we get distracted by the world around us. And we take our eyes off Jesus. You know what? There's so many distractions. 
in the Lord's work. There's so many things that want to take eyes off being a person of faith to just being someone who just comes and sits and warms a pew on a Sunday. But we have to be people of faith when we fix our eyes to him in the heavenlies. If your sight is dropped, let's be a person of faith that, like Abraham, we fix our eyes upon Jesus. We lift up our head and we cast our eyes on Jesus Christ. The next idea of be a person of faith is that faith is rooted. Faith is rooted. In verse 7, we discover Isaac said to his father Abraham, my father, he said, here I am, son. And he said, behold, the fire and the wood we have, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide. Everyone say, God will provide. God will provide. Abraham's faith was rooted in the fact that God will provide. His faith was rooted in this idea that I've seen God do it before.
knew that God was someone he can trust. And in Genesis 22, again, the angel says this, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for I know that you fear God. See, you have not withheld your son, your only son. Again, in verse 16, because you have done this and not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. You know, when we, when we read scripture and when you study scripture, there's a few things that you need to be mindful of. When there is repetition within scripture, you need to go, okay, hang on, God's trying to get our attention. And twice we read in Genesis 22 that Abraham did not withhold from God. He did not withhold. Not only that, he read three times that God will provide. It's like, I will provide, I will provide, I will provide. But right here, we notice that Abraham fully trusted, therefore he withheld nothing from God. For some of us in here, Maybe you believed a preacher one day and it didn't go to plan. Maybe you prayed and it didn't get answered in your time. Maybe you asked for a miracle and the miracle didn't happen. And we're in the land of confusion and the land of disappointment. And God is saying to us today, in order to be a faith-filled people, we've got to not withhold. Don't withhold from God. Because in the very picture that we see here, as Abraham was a Jesus turns his disciples. 
disciples in the boat. He said, where is your faith, God? You've been with me for years now. Where is your faith? I commanded you and said, go over to the other side. I gave you the word, my command to go. All you needed to do, I gave you the authority and the command I gave you. You yourselves could have commanded the wind and the rain and the waves to calm down because I gave you my word. Jesus to work through my life. Whether he does or not, I'm just going to be a bit. 